Assalamu alaikum, this is Dr. Mona el author of the Muslim Narcissist book. In this podcast, I will be speaking about the strange and twisted sexual desires of narcissists. I am creating this podcast as a follow-up to my last one, because after I actually posted my last one, I received so many emails and DMs about all of the strange and horrific sexual experiences that they have had with their narcissistic partners, and I felt that I really needed to create this podcast to create an awareness of what actually goes on inside a narcissist's mind when it comes to marital intimacy. And honestly, there are so many people out there who are suffering. Today's podcast is going to be a very uncomfortable one for me to record. It's not going to be easy, but I've collected the emails and DMs and stories that I've had from clients in order to record this podcast today. So... I'm hoping and praying that inshallah this podcast will be a platform for everyone's voices who find it really difficult to speak about these subjects. It's considered to be a taboo subject and it's also considered to be something, you know, to be embarrassed and ashamed about, especially for those who are going through it and tolerating it in silence because they feel either the narcissistic partner justifies it Islamically or because they don't want to lose their marriage and be shamed in society or for whatever other reason they don't want to lose their kids they don't want to you know to ha- to be the cause of a broken home they're scared a lot of people are scared to leave a toxic marriage with a narcissist i'm going to do another podcast inshallah about how to actually leave a toxic marriage i'll leave that for another day but there are many people who are terrified of especially women terrified of leaving a toxic marriage, a very abusive marriage, especially when it's sexually abusive because of how much their partner, their husband has intimidated them and scared them into staying. And so this podcast is actually about those people, those narcissists who actually come across as very practicing, very religious in society and what actually goes on behind closed doors Because a lot of my clients and a lot of people I speak to are married to imams and scholars and da'wah preachers, including all the uh, TikTok preacher guys who go on and on about the deen. And you'd be horrified as to what actually goes on behind closed doors. It's not just women, it's also men married to Quran teachers, married to Tajweed teachers, married to alimas. And you'll see in this podcast what they go through. And this is something that I really want to expose because a lot of sheikhs in courthouses and sharia courts, they do not believe women when they complain about these things in court to get a khula because they just can't believe that a man, their husband, who is so practicing or he's known in society could do such a thing, could do such vile, filthy, filthy things. And a lot of women when they go to apply for a divorce, they're so ashamed to actually tell people what goes on in the bedroom um, when it comes to sexual abuse because, you know, it's out of modesty as well. that they're, they're too ashamed to actually give the real reasons for them wanting a divorce and so they stay silent. And when they stay silent, the sheikh will always, will often tell them, sister, you've got no reason for divorce. There's no valid reason for divorce. And she's burning inside because she can't actually tell the sheikh what's actually going on in the in the bedroom because it's so vile and so awful that even she can't even she can't say it either. And so a lot of women actually get turned away for their reasons not being valid enough to get a khula. And it's because women are too too scared and too ashamed to reveal this kind of information that I'm gonna reveal today in this podcast. So uh I hope you are buckled up. And you haven't just eaten. Because what you're going to hear might actually make you feel very sick. Like it did with me. And as always, just before I jump into the podcast, please do share this podcast with people who may need to hear this information. Do like the video to help the YouTube algorithm. And do subscribe to the channel for even more content that is coming soon, inshallah, to help and heal everybody. So let's jump into this. Our sexual orientation, our sexual preferences, and what we lean towards is influenced by different factors in life, right? First of all, it's influenced by our fitra. So our fitra is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us upon. It's our natural instinct. And our natural instinct by fitra, according to Islam, is that men are attracted to women and women are attracted to men. 
and that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the concept of marriage, he said to us that it is sakan mawadda rahma. And sakan is that stability and that home and peace. Mawadda is that deep love. It's a unique kind of love because of the sexual intimacy involved. And you have rahma. Rahma is the mercy, the mercy you have towards each other. So you don't abuse each other and you're compassionate and understanding towards each other. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us to be attracted to the opposite sex. And we're also created to view intimacy as a beautiful bond. Okay, it's a beautiful bond that makes marriage so special. Because we can't have that bond with anyone else. We can only have that connection, that physical connection with the person whom we're married to. And that's why the person whom we're married to is one of the most important choices of our lifetime. Because if we marry the wrong person, our views of intimacy can be greatly distorted and we can actually become traumatized when we're married to the wrong person. Because narcissistic people have a very different outlook on what intimacy should be like. The way they view marriage, the way they view wives and husbands and the way they view sex is completely different to how empathic people view. View life in general, view marriage and and everything. They don't see and that's why they're not compatible. That's why empaths should never marry narcissists. Now, codependents are people with empathic traits, but they're not empaths. So... I'm going to come on to all of this later in the podcast, inshallah, but I just wanted to make all of this clear because anyone who diverts from the natural fitrah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us upon has now entered the realm of abnormality, okay? Has now entered the realm of abnormality. What they do is considered to be outside the realm of natural human instincts. It's outside what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, you know, created us for created us to be so if you look at the story of the shaitan what did the shaitan promise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he promised Allah that he would do his very best to make people deviate from their fitrah and when people deviate from their fitrah they go against Islamic teachings they go against what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted for us so we will change as human beings if we divert from our fitrah and we will also have very strange relationships and abusive relationships with other people because for someone who is diverted away from the fitrah, marriage is an institution in which he or she can abuse somebody rather than love somebody and respect somebody. And that's why narcissists are happy being in abusive relationships. They're happy being in marriages in which their partners hate them because they don't view marriage in the same way empaths and believers do they don't they view marriage in a very satanic way and it's because they've diverted from their fitra how are they diverted from their fitra they're diverted from their fitra because they're controlled by their qareen if you don't know what a qareen is please go back to my previous podcast all of this will make sense when you listen to my previous ones you will only heal when you listen to all of my previous podcasts, I have created them in a sequel for you to understand what I'm talking about. If this is your first time listening to one of my podcasts, you're not going to understand what I'm talking about. So please, in order to gain a full understanding of what I'm saying, do go back to my previous podcasts and listen to them all whenever you have time. Because I promise you, if you can't afford counselling and coaching, if you are too embarrassed to go to a counsellor for therapy... I promise you, listening to my podcast will heal you, inshallah, because you will be able to make sense of everything that's happened in your life. Everything. And there's so much more information to come. I'm brimming at the seams with information to unload on you all, inshallah, okay? So, as I've taught you all before, narcissism does start developing from childhood, but your qareen does not come into effect. He does not step into his role until you reach the age of puberty, when you are now accountable for your decisions and your sins. Because there's no point in him or her stepping into stepping into your childhood and messing around with your head when you're not going to be accountable for any sins anyway. So to the qareen, it's wasted time. It's wasted effort. So the qareen during childhood is to sleep. 
you know, they're taking that time to just chill, to sleep. They may make, you know, children irritable. Children also see bad spirits at night. Um, all of that can come from the Qareen playing with their minds. But ultimately, the Qareen knows that these children are not going to be accountable for anything. So they'll just, you know, they'll mess around with them, but it's nothing, nothing serious, okay? It only becomes serious when someone becomes accountable for their sins because now the Qareen's mission is to make you deviate from your fitrah. It's meant to be there in your life so that you make the wrong choices in life that do not take you to paradise because that's what the shaitan has asked all the qareens to do and the shaitan has given them a mission you make sure this person does not die a believer you make sure that this person does not die having repented from all their sins you make sure that this person dies and he or she is not loved by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is shaitan's mission for all of our Qareens, apart from the Qareen of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who was actually a good Qareen who helped him with his da'wah mission. He was the only one who didn't have an, e- an evil Qareen. Now, the evil Qareen that we all have, it's, it's evil. He or she is evil because they have chosen. Again, the jinn have free will. The Qareens are all soldiers of the shaitan who have chosen to obey the shaitan. That's why they're all evil. You don't get good. Uh, you don't get good qareens. If we had good qareen, we would all be fine. <laughs> None of us would have jihad and nafs. None of us would have those inner battles. If you know, if we had good uh, qareens who who change, they are specifically soldiers of the of the shaitan, and that's why we all have the ability to have evil thoughts. All of us have the ability to have evil thoughts and deviate from. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us for. So, like I said, if that wasn't the case, if our, you know, um, jinn devils were, you know, had the ability to be good, if they chose to be good, none of us would have these problems. None of us would ever have evil thoughts. All our evil thoughts come from the qareen. And it's up to us whether we act upon it or not. It's up to our nafs. Our nafs decides on whether it's going to act upon the whispers of the shaitan, the shaita, the satanic qareen, or not. That's why it's our nafs that will be accountable on the day of judgment for our sins. Because the nafs is the one who listens or doesn't listen to the qareen. And the nafs will take consultation from our intellect and our soul that's connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before making a decision. That's why Allah gave us intellect and that's why we have a soul. Our soul and our nafs are completely different. They're different entities. Our souls belong to Jannah and our nafs will be the one that's punished in the grave and the hereafter. So I'm just reminding you of this because when a teenager is, you know, it's attacked by the Qareen with evil thoughts, that's why you get very moody teenagers, teenagers who are unbearable to live with, You know, they used to be very sweet children. All of a sudden, they're just horrible teenagers. They're filthy, they're vile, they live in very unhygienic conditions, especially boys. If you want to know if a teenage boy, especially a teenage boy, has been overpowered by his qareen, look at the state of his bedroom. Just look at the state of his bedroom. If he's living in filth and his room stinks and his room is just so disgusting, know that he's been overpowered by his qareen. Because the jinn love to live in disgusting conditions. That's why, um, you know, there's we have athkar before we go into the bathroom. Because the jinn like to gather there. The jinn like to gather in caves, underwater, in sewages, in dark forests. Like, in places that are just unpleasant. Right? Unpleasant to be in. And that's why it's very abnormal for people to spend very long times in the bathroom. And you'll find that your narcissistic partners and your narcissistic children spend so long in the bathroom. Because for a believer, they know that the bathroom is not a place to spend too much time. And they don't actually like being in the bathroom for very long periods of time. Whereas narcissists do. A narcissist will do everything in the bathroom. You know, they might watch videos in the bathroom. They might pleasure themselves in the bathroom. They do everything in the bathroom and it attracts more gin to them. So the more time you spend in the bathroom, 
the more likely you are to attract uh, evil evil gen towards you and codependence as well a lot of codependents they go into the bathroom to cry for very long periods of time when your vibrational level is so low because you're feeling depressed you match the vibrational energy of the jinn and the jinn can actually possess you when you're in such a low mood when you're angry when you're bitter when you're grieving when you're sad when you're angry all of all of those negative emotions attract the jinn to you even when you're in shock it can attract the jinn to you so when you're crying and in the bathroom you will always feel a lot worse when you come out of the bathroom because the jinn have prayed and they're feeding on your vulnerability at that time and you'll always feel a lot worse there's something subhanallah that's connected to the energy of those who cry a lot in the bathroom and the prophet Muhammad he warned people about this you know he he, he warned people about not saying uh, the dua of entering the bathroom because he knew that there were evil spirits in the bathroom who liked to lurk there and if you don't know it the dua is Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al khubthi wal khaba'ith, which is, Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from all evil and the evil doers. So don't forget this dua every time you enter the bathroom. Now I'm mentioning all of this because it's a sign in teenagers. It's a sign in teenagers that, you know, they're starting to become overpowered by their qareen. Now, a narcissistic person is someone, is an adult, who is overpowered by their qareen. So when someone, when a teenager is overpowered by their qareen, they start doing things that are, you know, are a deviation from the fitra. Now they start to listen to strange music. Now they're starting to watch porn. Now they're starting to watch horror movies that just normal people wouldn't watch. Like there, is, there are some vile movies out there that are considered to be entertainment for people when it's full of such horrific stuff that no normal person would find entertaining because it's all stuff about the jinn and little girl ghosts and dolls that come to life and zombies and rage viruses and psychopathic killers and murderers and, you know, animals that turn into beasts or things that morph into other things and aliens, God knows what. No one normal would actually enjoy watching things like this. No one normal. I'm telling you, I don't trust anyone who watches horror movies. <laughs> I'll tell you that. As soon as someone tells me they love horror movies, I'm out of there. Because for someone to really enjoy watching things about the djinn and scary things that happen at night and them not being phased by it at all, know that that person is not only overpowered by the qareen, but they have a aashiq jinn too. Because the aashiq jinn will always target people who are in that environment, in the environment of watching so much pornography, in the environment of listening to such vile music as well. I mean, all of it is just about whip that, slap that, bang that, smoke that. Like, and people enjoy it. People enjoy it. I remember so many times, you know, I was driving into the city and... I'd be at a traffic light. I'd look next to me. There are a couple, you know, a few guys in a car. They're blaring out their music. Muslim guys, unfortunately, they'd have their windows down and they're playing Fifty Cent or whatever rappers, you know, they are. And the lyrics are so disgusting, so sexual that there is no shame in them actually having their windows down and letting other people listen to the same filth that they're listening to. And then you wonder why so many Muslim men turn out to be so sex mad when they're older it's because they're feeding their minds from teenage years all this rap all this filth all this garbage that's what they're putting into their intellect that is what they're wasting their lives on and I just looked at them like I couldn't believe that they were just so desensitized to the shame and actually listening to this and allowing other people to hear that they're listening to it as well like, it was vile sexual language that should not be in public. But a lot of young Muslims have become so desensitised to it now because it's been normalised. It's been so normalised. And again, with pornography, it's not just normal pornography between man and woman. Oh, no, 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 no. 
Now there's all sorts of pornography. There's incest pornography. There's paedophilic pornography. There's gay pornography. A lot of young people, young Muslims, who are neglected by their parents, are watching filth. I'm telling you, they're watching filth. And the more they watch this kind of filth, the more their brains become wired to understanding sex in a different way to normal people. Now they're getting programmed to actually be turned on by what they're seeing, no matter how vile it is. Now they're getting turned on by gay porn. Now they're getting turned on by incest porn. Now they're getting turned on by group porn, you know, like, you know, like people who have sex on multiple people at the same time. They're seeing all of this and it's appealing. It's now becoming appealing to them because the Aashiq Jinn is working on them. The Aashiq Jinn will change your fitra. And that's why a lot of teenagers, they lean towards homosexuality when they're, you know, when they're learning about sex and, and relationships. A lot of them will start having feelings for people of the same sex because the Aashiq Jinn and their Qareen are working together to change the fitra of that person. That is how someone becomes homosexual. Homosexuality comes from your Qareen and the Aashiq Jinn changing your fitra. Because now you're becoming attracted to people whom you're not meant to be attracted to. You're becoming attracted to people who are forbidden for you Islamically. There are people who are attracted to their sisters and their mothers and their fathers and their uncles and children. You know, as we as we see now, people are sexually attracted to animals because it all comes from their kind. You're telling me this is normal? Some people say love is love. No, 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 no. Love is not love. Love is not love in the wrong place when it's placed in the wrong place. That now becomes a disorder. That now becomes a problem. Because if you start developing sexual feelings for your parents and your sisters, like people are now in America, they're campaigning to marry their their siblings because love is love. Then where, until when? Where is it going to take us if governments are going to allow people to follow their desires? And as we know, you know, there's a whole satanic agenda behind the governments, but that's something else, another, that's another subject. But there are people in America who are already campaigning for the right to marry their siblings because they're in love with them. And, you know, eventually, eventually, I believe that's going to be normalized the same way everything now has been normalized. Now, even the whole idea of someone being a paedophile isn't as bad as it was 10, 20 years ago. Paedophiles, okay, it's become it's become a normal thing now. To, to hear about paedophiles slowly slowly these things become normalized because we're living in a satanic secular society because the shaitan is always always working hard to make people deviate from their fitra and if pornography and horror movies and explicit music lyrics are not doing it then hey let's give you some netflix as well let's give you some netflix and movies to help you along the way help you along the way to deviate you from the fitra. So now Netflix is all about having affairs. Loads of sexual content now. You can't watch anything on Netflix without sexual content coming up. And not even normal sexual content. Some of it's vile. And a lot of it as well is encouraging homosexuality. A lot of it is encouraging BDSM, which is bondage and discipline, dominance and submission, in which someone is the dominant person in the sexual relationship and someone has to be a submissive and pleasure is inflicted by pain so the person who is dominant will test the pain threshold of the submissive and he or she will keep doing things to that person to the submissive until they reach a level of pain that is intolerable it's just unbearable so it's it's a sadistic kind of pleasure that the one who is dominant gets from the submissive i'll come on to that again in a moment because right now i just want you guys to understand how this all develops in the minds of narcissistic adults so you know if they're watching movies like 50 shades of gray and other similar movies 
then they are going to program their minds to believe that this is an exciting way to have sex. This is an exciting way to incorporate, you know, sexual practices to make a marriage work. I'm going to incorporate BDSM. I'm going to apply what I've learned in pornography, even though half the stuff that is so vile in pornography, you know, people don't do it for free. People are getting paid crazy amounts of money to do outrageous things in pornography. But narcissists actually want to apply what people get paid thousands and thousands to do in their own marriages. They expect it from their own wives, which is ridiculous. And it's insane because they completely forget that people who are originally involved in pornography have zero dignity, zero dignity, zero iman, zero morals, zero principles. They have nothing. It's it's nothing. They are just pawns and excuse the pun, but they're just pawns that the shaitan uses in order to facilitate his plan. Let's get people involved in watching pornography so they have a twisted idea about sex and intimacy and then, hey, that will ruin their marriages or maybe it will deter them from getting married or maybe it will, you know, cause issues in the marriage. At the end of the day, the, the shaitan knows that in order for him to corrupt the ummah, he's got to corrupt the marriage first. He's got to corrupt all the marriages first. And if those marriages have children, even better, broken homes. Divorce rate is up to 75% in the Muslim ummah. Like, that is horrific. Horrific because people are choosing the wrong people to marry. And most people are now marrying narcissists. Most people are marrying covert narcissists. And covert narcissists have very strange, twisted sexual minds because of their qareen and ashaq gen issues. And you won't know that until you marry them. They're never going to tell you that. They might flirt with you in the beginning. They might start sexual conversation. They might want to know what you're into. They might want to get an idea if you're going to be up for doing the things that they're fantasizing about. That's why you get a lot of practicing men and women who start conversations of a sexual nature with you. Because they don't want to waste their time if you're not up for BDSM. If you're not up for the crazy things that are going on in their head. And that's why you find a lot of people who are imams, who are religious you know, people in authority... They will have inappropriate conversations with you and ask you inappropriate questions. Now, if you're codependent, you will entertain it. If you're narcissistic or codependent, you will entertain those conversations. You won't find them. You might find them a bit, oh, that's a bit weird coming from that imam. That's a bit weird coming from that Quran teacher. Didn't expect them to open that conversation. But now you're infatuated with that person. You actually entertain it because you're interested in them. They have to get you to a point where they know you've fallen for them, where they know that you're infatuated with them, especially if they're good looking. Once they have you hooked, that's when the sexual conversations will start. So tell me what's your fantasy. Tell me about this and tell me about that. That's when it starts. And then the codependent, who has very low self-esteem, will get roped into having sexual conversations with someone who is meant to be religious because that person needs to determine if you're going to be a submissive. If you're going to be someone, they can apply everything that they've seen in their lives from pornography, from Netflix shows, from movies and from music. If they're going to apply everything onto you or not. Some people... They realise that I can't actually have this conversation with, with her or with him. And they just wait until marriage to hit you with it. Quite literally. They'll hit you with it. And maybe it's your first time getting married. And, you, and you're like, oh my god, what's this? What the hell am I dealing with? You've got no experience. No experience in sex. No experience in intimacy. And this person is taking advantage of you being so naive. So now... This is mainly with men. The man will start to program you as a young virgin to accept all of his weird and twisted ways. And he will tell you that they're normal. It's normal to have these fantasies or these thoughts or to want this and want that. 
they that's why a lot of these religious people they want the the, the naive virgins because the naive virgin especially if she's codependent will be up for anything because she doesn't want to get a divorce and also because she just she's so infatuated she'll do anything to please the guy anything I'm telling you, anyone who is highly codependent will do anything for a narcissist without realising he or she is being abused. They don't know. But religious people prey on virgins for this reason. And people who are, well, they show that they're religious, but they've had, they've got a history of pornogra- of watching pornography. Boy, are you in for a ride. Boy, are you in for the shock of your life? Because you would never expect that they would be so twisted sexually because you believe that they're religious and that they would be decent, right? Decent and moral in what they expect of you. But it's always the opposite. It's always those people who come across as being very religious who are the most twisted in their heads. Very disturbing. Very, very disturbing what goes on in their heads. Just because someone appears as being religious does not mean that they're empaths. A lot of these people are narcissists. Narcissists who are absolutely obsessed about sex, but not in a way you'd think. They're obsessed about sex in a way that is more satanic than human. I'm going to list loads of things that people have told me in just a moment, you know, to explain this and give you examples But I just want you to understand where it comes from. It's not something that happens overnight. It's an obsession that grows from teenage years. So when a teenager starts to develop a narcissistic, you know, narcissistic personality disorder, that is when you will start to notice, even as a parent, that they're into strange things, that they're unhygienic, that they're, you know, they just think about sex all the time. They think about girls all the time. They objectify women all the time. Because sex now becomes the goal for marriage. And they a lot of them marry young because they are so hyped up from the pornography that they watch that the women they marry are just objectified. They don't marry for the right reasons. And that's why we have so many divorces in our ummah because people are marrying for the wrong reasons. A lot of men are marrying just to have sex just to fulfill all their fantasies and everything that they've seen in pornography. And then they have problem marital problems because there are many times when the woman doesn't want to comply. She's not accepting of what he's asking her to do and he's disappointed and he doesn't he wants out now. He wants out. This isn't what I expected. This isn't what I hoped for. He'll issue a talaq. The woman is now left devastated because she went into this marriage thinking it was forever thinking it was, you know, she was doing the best thing for her deen, only to realise that actually she was a big letdown sexually because she wasn't up for doing half the vile things that he's seen in pornography. And women can also marry for sex as well, even if they're virgins. There are many virgins, especially those who have been sexually abused as young girls. If they've been sexually abused, especially by family members like uncles or their fathers or their brothers, they will have many of them will develop narcissistic personality disorder as a defense mechanism and they will again they will grow up to see sex and intimacy as something dirty something shameful something vile and they will be into so many twisted things as well and you might be an empathic guy or a codependent guy and you marry one of these women she may never have told you that she's been abused sexually by a family member growing up. And you'll just find that she's into really weird things. Really, really weird things. For example, she would be the type of woman who would be absolutely fine with being whipped and slapped and gagged and suffocated and everything in the, in a marriage because she, that's what she believes she deserves. Her self-esteem would be so low because of how she sees herself. She would see herself as being damaged she would see herself as being worthless and dirty and, you know, not worth anything. So when a good man, you know, wants to approach her in the right way and, you know, make love to her properly and be kind and gentle with her, she doesn't like it. She feels that he's weak. He's, you know, he's just too pansy for her. 
because she's used to violence. She's used to aggression, especially if she's been raped. If she's been raped before, now that's all she wants. She wants the same kind of treatment because that's what she believes she deserves. I'm talking about the narcissistic woman, now an empathic woman or a codependent woman who has been sexually abused as a child or as a teenager or raped. She will seek therapy and help for herself. She will not accept this type of treatment in a marriage because she would never want to experience that ever again. But someone who is highly codependent, like codependent to the extreme, where she has no self-esteem, and a narcissistic woman who has no self-esteem, that's the link. Both the codependent and the narcissistic woman have to have a very low amount of self-esteem, or none at all, to continue the cycle of abuse to themselves, to themselves. They only want men who will continue treating them in the same violent, aggressive way that they've known growing up. And this is why red pill Muslim men who, who encourage other men to discipline and crack the whip and, you know, do this, be, you know, engage in BDSM and this and that. Women love it, women love it. What kind of women are you marrying? You're marrying women who come from very traumatic pasts. These are traumatised, troubled women who red pill Muslim men take full advantage of because they come from, you know, a background of, of abuse. They don't know any different. So when a good man comes into their lives, they're seen as boring. The good man is seen as very boring because this woman is used to something specific and the good man is not giving it to her. So if she's narcissistic, she might cheat on him and betray him with men who are vile. Vile. You'd look at the guy who she's cheated on you with and you'd think, him, you cheated on me with that. And, you'd, and he would be someone so awful, someone so disgusting, someone who would make your skin crawl, because that's what she's used to. She goes back to what's familiar. Always the case with narcissists, when they cheat on you, they always cheat on you with someone who comes across as being so vile, whether it's a man or a woman. They never cheat on you with someone normal. They will always cheat on you with someone who is either very slutty, if she's a woman, or very narcissistic and misogynistic if he's a man. One of those control freak type of guys. Gym rat type of guys. Because eventually narcissists always go back to whom they believe they deserve. When they cheat on you with someone and you see who that someone is, know that that is who the narcissist actually believes that they deserve. It's nothing to be upset about. It's just an indication of what's going on inside them. So you get a lot of men who, you know, they're devastated when their wives betray them, cheat on them, with men who are nothing like them. It's because of this. It's because you're too kind, you're too empathic, you're too loving for someone who's been so traumatised in their past. And even if you knew about it before you got married to her, even if you knew about it, you can't fix her, you're not the one to fix her. Don't go near a woman who is not healed from a violent past. You're not her saviour, you're not her hero. Because if she's not healed what's within herself, she's, if she's overpowered by her qareen, no amount of support and love and understanding is going to change that woman for you. You cannot magic a good wife out of a woman like that. She needs to go and get help, therapy, counselling, coaching. She needs to heal from what's happened to her in her past before she gets married and appreciates a good man. Don't marry anyone who comes from a sexually violent past or a very abusive past. If she's not healed from it, she's not sought any help for it. If she's relying on you for help and healing and support, know that you're going to experience hell. Hell in all its colours. Intimacy is going to be horrible. Because either she won't want it, she'll clam up every time you go near her because she gets flashbacks of being harassed and abused. She'll get that, she'll clam up because she's triggered. Or she's going to expect that you do things to her that you just won't accept for her. She might ask you to do crazy things 
Like pee on her, spit on her, whip her, hit her, beat her. She might ask you to do those things and you're, you're going to struggle doing that. But it's the only way she can gain any kind of sexual satisfaction or be aroused. Because that's what her qareen has programmed her mind to believe she needs in order to enjoy the experience. So if her, if her husband is not willing to do that, if he can't find it within himself to do something like that to her, she's his precious wife, I'm not going to do that to you. She gets bored and she gets angry and frustrated. Sometimes she'll force him to do it. And if she forces you to do something like that to her, to satisfy her, you're the one who's going to suffer. Your guilty conscience is going to kill you because now you're feeling disgusted at yourself that she's actually managed to get you to do it. You're going to feel so awful about yourself to the point where depression can start to kick in because this now has to be something on the regular. This is not just a one-off. Now you're going to discover all the weird porn that she's always watched, obsessively watched since she was a teenager. Now you're going to suffer knowing that she can only get sexual pleasure from using vibrators and toys because that's what she's used to women who get used to using sexual toys for pleasure will find it very difficult to gain pleasure from a man later because size difference and all that kind of stuff so a lot of men actually struggle with this as well if you get married to a woman who has been addicted to porn for a very long time she is going to already have her body used to gaining pleasure from the way she does things with toys and stuff. It's actually going to be harder for you to help her become satisfied with what you do for her. Because she spent years and years and years and years, you know, uh, getting used to a certain type of pleasure that she can achieve herself. Again, lots of men really struggle with this. And what's worse... Sometimes the women will make them feel really rubbish about it. Oh, you can't do it. You're useless. You're no good. You know, you can't make me climax. You can't, you know, you're you're not man enough. You're not man enough to do this for me. And then she'll go into the bathroom and disappear for ages. For ages. How does that make a man feel? When a narcissistic woman does that all the time. I'm telling you, I hear this all the time. This is what... A lot of religious women are doing. I'm talking about religious people here. People who pray and fast and wear the hijab and everything. They're doing this to their husbands and and men can't talk about it. A lot of men cannot talk about this because it's embarrassing. So the woman will go off into the bathroom, spend ages in there with her toys and whatever. And not only is he not being satisfied because she's annoyed with him now that he's not managed to do anything for her. She's made him feel, oh, you're not a man, you're useless. I'm just going to go and do it myself. I'm better off doing this alone. I don't need you. Disappears off into the bathroom, does her thing, and then comes out like nothing's happened. He goes without because she's punishing him now for not being able to satisfy her. And he has to live with that torture that she's locked herself in the bathroom and prefers to, to do it herself. And that can be really distressing for a man to know that there is no sexual intimacy in the marriage and that she's doing it herself. And he's sat in the in the house feeling like a clown because there's nothing he can really do about it. She's got her traumas from sexual abuse. She's too used to using toys. She can't get satisfied by him. She's belittling him. She's body shaming him as well. I'll come on to that as well in a bit. And he has to live with that in silence. Especially if he's got kids. This is something that a lot of men are tolerating and don't talk about. And it's not just women who do this. Men do this as well. They'll disappear into the bathroom and do their own thing. Especially when they know that their wife wants intimacy. But he feels that day that I'm not going to give it to you because you didn't listen to me. Or you didn't do that for me. You haven't cooked today. You haven't cleaned the house properly. You know, you phoned that friend and I told you not to phone that friend. You didn't cancel that appointment when I met, when I told you to cancel that appointment. You wore blue nail varnish when I told you to wear brown nail varnish. 
You wore that dress when I didn't want you to wear that dress. It's just over petty things. You'll find it over very petty things. And then he'll throw a hadith in your face about how the husband is displeased. And if the husband is displeased, the woman will never enter Jannah. The wife will never smell Jannah. And then he'll go and lock himself in the bathroom and make it known what he's doing in there. Not only is he punishing his wife by withholding intimacy, by making it obvious that he's doing it himself and he's not going to do anything with her, but he's also inflicting spiritual abuse because he's gone into the bathroom after throwing that hadith in her face without giving her a chance to even rectify it if she wanted to and make him feel a bit better, calm him down. He wants her to spend the rest of that evening feeling so rubbish about herself because he had to go into the bathroom and do what he needed to do as a result of her not being a good wife and now he's going to spend the rest of the evening displeased with her and if I'm displeased with you well God's going to be displeased with you as well I'm your gateway I'm your gateway to paradise me the clown the person who can't be a qawwam the one who's so petty I'm a man child I'm your gateway to paradise and a lot of women fall for it and they cry and they beg for forgiveness and they get on their knees and they run, you know, run circles around the guy. What can I do for you to make it up to you? He's laughing inside. His khalil laughing inside. Stop falling for the abuse of these idiots. But that's what men do. A lot of these men do that. They will go into the bathroom after throwing something like that at you because they want you to be tortured for the rest of the evening and then they want you to do everything that you can to make it up to them everything so they win they win because if you listen to my previous podcast you'll understand that men don't actually want any intimacy with their wives if they can't use you as an object then they don't really want that intimacy they're not really up for it unless they're up for it one day sometimes they feel like it and they'll engage with someone they'll engage with their wife or their husband but for the in the majority of the time they're actually happy doing things on their own they would prefer to do things on their own but if he's misogynistic like an open misogynistic red pill guy not the man child the open misogynistic i promise you he will make sure he rinses every penny he paid to marry you by using and abusing your body in every way and any time he can because he feels like it's his right and he's entitled to access to your body whenever he wants that's why he they're always quoting the hadith if a woman is on a camel saddle and her husband wants her she must come down to fulfill his desires oh you'll get that slapped around a lot because in his mind he now wants to make full use of every penny he's invested in marrying you to gain something out of it, to gain a sexual object out of it. Like you might as well be a silicone doll to these guys. And it's no wonder women who are married to men like this are always miserable. They're always bitter. They're always jealous of other women. They're always crabby, you know, they're always petty. They're always aggressive. It doesn't come from nowhere, you know. You know, they pretend to be happy with men like this. They pretend. But trust me, they are the most miserable women on this planet. Because they just don't feel human living with with men like this. They don't. Even men who are married to women who are so problematic don't feel human. Even they feel used and abused. Because narcissistic men and women are often very sex mad. But not sex mad in a way that you would believe. Sex mad in a way that... They just see you as an object. They just see you as a body to use. And because, you know, narcissists are very much attached to material and physical desires and pleasures, they will often seek pleasure in eating, in sexual contact and sexual pleasures and all of that kind of stuff. That's where they get their high from. And so you'll find that narcissistic men and women especially those who are who come across as religious 
are obsessed about sex. It's all they think about. And that's why narcissistic women are involved in lots of misyard marriages. They'll have four, five, six, seven husbands in their lifetime, at least. Because they do the halal hook, they're involved in a halal hookup culture that they've made halal. It's not halal. They've made it halal in their own weird world where a woman can be in her house. She'll have a weird nikah contract with that guy and he'll just come and go as he pleases until she's bored of him and she'll get someone else. Only narcissistic Muslim women do stuff like that. No one with dignity would do it. Believing women, believing Muslim women, they have izzat nafs, izzat nafs, that dignity. They want to be married in an honourable way. Not in a backstreet way, where they allow five, six, seven guys to come and go as they please just because they're, they can't control their sexual desires. What the hell? But narcissistic Muslim women, especially those from the Western Salafi community are always involved in this kind of stuff. You'll find them always involved in disastrous relationships like this because they, again, they come from those backgrounds. They come from those abusive backgrounds. They come from environments in which this is normalised. It's normalised for them and they fuel the red pill movement in other men. Again, go back to my... Go back to my podcast about the red pill women. They enable men like this. And they're the most miserable, I'm telling you, they're the most miserable women I've ever come across in my life. Because they're used and abused, their bodies are just there to be used and abused. And they allow it, they enable it. Secret misyar marriages, guys, is not Islamic. It's not Islamic. It degrades the value of a woman. It's basically a hookup culture that they have made halal for themselves. That is what women who are obsessed about sex will do to themselves. So if you're a decent guy, don't get involved with people like that. Avoid people like that, like the plague. Because they come with a lot of trauma. They come with a lot of negative energy that you don't want in your life. And men as well, who keep offering misyar marriage options to women, backstreet nikah contracts, avoid them like the plague. Avoid them like the plague because, well, lahi, they have diseased hearts. These men have diseased hearts. You're going to be used and abused and then discarded for something better later. You're just a body to them. You're just a body. So I'm going to go through some things that people have mentioned to me this week. And you're probably, you know, if you're listening, you'll probably relate to a few of these things. Hopefully not everything, but, you know, I hope it will explain inshallah what you're going through. If you're going through this and what you need to avoid. I release these podcasts to help you avoid marrying these horrible people, Okay. These are people, again, they are ruled by their qareen. You're not marrying them, you're marrying their qareen. You're marrying their qareen who hates you and hates them. Because the first person the qareen wants to destroy is the narcissist. And the narcissist doesn't realise that his qareen is his enemy or her enemy. They will destroy the narcissist first and then destroy everyone else. And they destroy the narcissist by making themselves sabotage everything good in their life. And this is a way of them doing that. Weird sexuality, abnormal sexuality, is one of the ways in which both the Ashaq jinn and the Qareen jinn will work on a you know work with a narcissist to destroy marriages and just societies in general, like we see now with the hookup culture. Look at the hookup culture in Western society and non-Muslim Western society. Look how it's ruined everything. The concept of intimacy and marriage are so alien now in western society that what's vile and abnormal has now become the new normal so you know i always i always think that a lot of our muslim men are envious of non-muslim men who can go around and sleep with whoever they want without any nikah contract without any mahar without any of that and it's almost like when they marry a woman 
It's like, because I can't do that, because I can't sleep around, because I have to marry every woman I want to sleep with, you are going to comply with what I want. You are going to fulfill all my fantasies and all my sexual desires because you're the only person who can do this for me. And sometimes it gets forced on someone. Because now that wife or that husband believe that you owe them because you're the only person who can do it. You owe them compliance with everything that's in their head because they can't be a part of the hookup culture. So let me go through the let me go through the list of things that I have compiled to share with you. And I just wanted to make a quick note as well before I just go on to the list is that there's a difference between man children and woman children and openly misogynistic men and openly misogynistic women. So those who are red pill, they are the ones who will kind of, you know, they have no shame and they will enforce everything that they want to do onto you. Whereas the man children and the man and the women children, they run away from sex. They they would actually prefer not to have that much contact and that's how they can go for weeks and months without any sexual contact with you because they would prefer to have all of their sexual fantasies fulfilled by someone else and not you because you're again in maternal mode or paternal mode so you're either her father in the relationship or you're his mother in the relationship and all his sexual fantasies can't be fulfilled by you he goes out of the relationship to fulfill them or he would just prefer to have solo sex do it on his own because you will realise anyway that you won't have much sexual contact with someone who's like that, someone who's a man-child. They're too immature and, you know, it, it might be it might be that he will have um, moments where he, you know, he or she will want that sexual contact and that intimacy, but it's not something that they often initiate and it's not regular. So again, if you want to know more about this, please listen to my previous podcast about the man children and the woman children, because they don't actually, when they see you as mother or father, their minds can't process seeing you as a wife or a husband at the same time. Whereas the red pill misogynists, the red pill women too, oh no, they're sex mad and they'll want everything from you all the time. So just wanted to make that clear to differentiate between the two. So let's move on to the list of things I've compiled from people's stories. And, oh, God help me. God help me go through this list. My skin is crawling from what I'm about to say. But let's go through it quickly. So the first one, weird fantasies. I had a woman come and tell me that one of the things that shocked her after she got married to a man who was supposedly very practicing, very religious, goes to the masjid all the time and posts a lot of religious things online. She said one day when they were, you know, having sexual intercourse, um, she asked him why he kept closing his eyes. And he said, if I tell you, you'll be upset. So she said, no, no, tell me, I'd like to know, you know, why, why you always have your eyes closed. And he said, I imagine you with other men and it excites me. And it was so shocking for her to hear him say that because it was so unexpected but he actually has to close his eyes and imagine her with other men in order to be able to climax and enjoy the experience and there was also a message that I received from a brother who said to me that he actually found out his wife also closes her eyes during sexual intercourse because she imagines herself with another man while she's sleeping with him And he found out because she mentioned his name during intercourse. So he knew that she was thinking about being with someone else while she was with him. And of course, this is a trauma. You know, this can trigger immense feelings of insecurity and distress and trauma. So, you know, it's not a good thing. I'll tell you now, it's not a good thing. If, if, you know, you're with someone, you're having sexual intercourse with someone and they always want to close their eyes during the you know, during the whole thing, it's often because they need to go somewhere else in their head in order to enjoy the experience. And, you know, another sister told me that, you know, while being with her husband, he would ask her questions about her friends, intimate questions about her friends. 
And, you know, has she ever been in a lesbian relationship before? Has she ever kissed a woman before? You know, these are things that they want to know while they're in the middle of their lust because they need this information to be able to enjoy the experience because their minds are so twisted. So their weird fantasies of their wives being with other men or being raped or, you know, like just really weird things that they would think about or even confess to. And sometimes, by by the way, they don't confess consciously. If they confess something like that, know that it's come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm going to do a whole new podcast about how Allah exposes these people. Allah will expose these people in so many ways to you that you guys ignore. This is one of the ways. When someone tells you about their fantasies and the fantasies are so outrageous, know that that they've slipped up and that Allah is trying to show you something. I mean, someone even told me that she was sleeping with her husband and he had his eyes closed and he kept mentioning a man's name, another man's name. So, you know, it's an indicator that he's closet gay or he's closet bisexual. A lot of these guys are closet gay and closet bisexual. You know, visit my previous podcast to learn more about that. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will expose these people to you in intimacy because you know, there will be times when they will slip up unconsciously because they're in the middle of enjoying a very deep emotion of like lust or whatever. So weird fantasies is one of the, you know, a common thing that comes up when, you know, being with a a narcissist. Another thing people have told me is that they've caught their narcissistic husbands or wives watching strange porn. That, you know, they've walked into a room or they've caught them on their phone watching like incest porn or child pornography or parental porn, gay porn. They've caught them watching something strange. And when they get caught, they usually say, oh, this just came up on my phone and I got curious. And that's if they're caught not masturbating to the porn. Now, a lot of women and men are catching their narcissistic wives and husbands masturbating to very strange porn. Again, it's not normal porn, man and woman. It can be group porn as well. You know, a woman being harassed by four or five men at the same time or like, you know, gay porn or whatever. But a lot of these people are being caught, pleasuring themselves to really bad porn. And it's been so shocking for some people that they just haven't been able to tell anyone about it. Who would they tell? Who could they tell? You know, it's it's something so embarrassing, so shameful. Who would they tell? So they keep it to themselves. But it's something that simmers within them. Like, I can't believe my husband or my wife is choosing to watch this filth and pleasure themselves rather than fulfill my sexual rights. They prefer to do that than be with me. And that can grow depression. Depression within one's heart can grow and grow and grow until your qareen overpowers you as well. Until you become narcissistic like the narcissist. Because you just become like, you just you turn into a different person from the resentment and anger and bitterness and frustration. Especially if you decide to stay with them and cover up. Covering up over long periods of time can turn many women and many men into narcissists. And that's why you often find that women who started off codependent in their marriage, 10, 20 years later, they're now full-blown narcissists because of everything that they've had to tolerate and watch and keep silent on. So they now become narcissistic to their own children as a way of unloading everything that they've been through So a lot of people are catching husbands and wives doing this. And again, I keep referring to people who come across as religious. This podcast is about Muslim narcissists. People who claim to be spiritual and religious and whatever. They're catching their husbands and wives doing these things. Another thing is experiencing, you know, hearing vile and degrading language. So again, I have a woman who said, while they're in the bedroom, 
He keeps calling her a whore. He keeps calling her... I don't want to repeat the words, but just horrible names. Degrading names that he feels arouses him. And a lot of these men, they use vile language because they often saw their fathers use it on their mothers as well. It's not always just from porn. It can also come from witnessing their mothers being treated in the same way. A lot of children hear what goes on in parents' bedrooms, especially if they live in small houses or apartments. Don't think that children can't hear what's going on, and teenagers as well. I have a teenage client, he's 17, and he tells me, I hear my father raping my mother at night. I hear her screaming and begging him to stop, and he doesn't stop. And he says, I have to take two pillows to to stop myself from hearing it or I put music in my ears and blast it because I just don't want to hear it and I'm getting depressed and I can't say anything to my dad because my dad is scary as hell. I don't want them to know that I can hear it. But he said, my bedroom is next to theirs and I hear my father rape my mother and abuse her and hit her and everything and she's always crying Every time they have sex, he's like, my mother's always crying. So there are lots of teenagers growing up, you know, being programmed to believe that this is normal as well. A lot of teenagers just grow up thinking this is normal. It's okay to treat your wife like that. And those who find it abnormal, it doesn't mean that they get healed from it or that they don't do it. They just start to find solace in other problematic things like watching porn. And this porn takes them down a very slippery slope in which they start to become interested in other types of porn. And, you know, because they find solace there. They find solace there. They might even start to research, why is my mum screaming? Why is she crying? And then he'll come across BDSM, for example. And then he'll realise that, oh, maybe that's what they're doing. Oh, let me look into it. Oh, it looks fun. Oh, maybe I can try that when I'm older. The qareen of that teenager is going to start distorting the way he sees life and the way he sees problems and solving problems. Because he, this this particular client is telling me that he's looking into pain as pleasure. And that's where it starts. That's where it starts because he, you know, he doesn't want to believe that his mum's being raped. He wants to, in order to justify it in his mind and bring peace to himself, he wants to believe that it's BDSM. That his mum's actually enjoying it. He's like, no, 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 she can't be raped. But I know she's being raped. But no, 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 I can't believe that she's being raped. It has to be BDSM. She must enjoy it. And then he looks into it. And then when he looks into it, he's like, actually, this actually looks quite... Hmm, appealing. I think I'd like to try that for myself. And then it starts from there. So BDSM starts from vile language. Calling women horrible names. Calling a man horrible names. And it degrades that person. Now let me tell you something. I'll tell you something here. And listen to me carefully when I say this. When someone, when a narcissist wants to apply BDSM to you, the dominant submissive relationship in in intimacy, and they want to test your threshold for pain because they find it pleasurable to torture you, know that this type of physical abuse will often be covered by their need to be turned on and aroused. And I say that, what do I mean by that? Because they wouldn't be able to do that to you in the daytime. They can't just come and slap you when they're annoyed with you. They can't, I mean, they can. But if someone is wary about his self-image and public image, and he's worried about you complaining to other people about him slapping you, hitting you, calling you a whore, calling you, you know, horrible names, making you do horrible things, testing your pain threshold, 
if he's doing that to you during the day when he's not aroused, it's going to be seen as abuse, right? You're going to get upset. Why are you slapping me? Why are you calling me a whore? Why are you beating me? Why are you whipping me? Why are you gagging me and suffocating me? But somehow, he manages to brainwash you and manipulate you and convince you that it's okay to do that in the bedroom. So he actually fulfills his desires of physically abusing you when he's in the bedroom under the guise of him being aroused. That's where he takes it out on you. BDSM comes from narcissistic pleasure. It's a satanic pleasure. Because the Prophet Muhammad said, I forbid anyone to even hit an animal in a way that causes it any kind of pain. Don't inflict pain on an animal, let alone pain on, a, on another human being, unless it's in self-defense, in war. You want to you know, you defend yourself, you do whatever you need to defend yourself. But for you to be the one who inflicts any kind of pain, this is haram in Islam, forbidden in Islam, let alone in intimacy, which is meant to be the most beautiful, romantic, you know, connection you can ever have with anybody. After Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after your connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and your connection with your mother from the womb, the most beautiful connection that you have is that intimate contact with your spouse. So to incorporate something satanic like BDSM in which pain is felt for pleasure, know that that narcissist qareen is, is punishing the empath in you. I promise you. It's a chance for that qareen of that narcissist to take out his abuse on you and validate it because now you're accepting it because you're like, well, if that's what it takes to turn him on, yep, do that to me. Do you see how he's manipulated you into accepting physical abuse under the name of him? Fulfilling his sexual needs. And not only that, he will, de he will demand obedience and compliance because it's his sexual right. You know, it's his right to be, you know, fulfilled sexually. And this is the only way he can be fulfilled sexually. Then you need to oblige. You need to oblige to be a good wife. So you find yourself all of a sudden accepting things you would never have accepted before. Because you've been brainwashed religiously into thinking, well, maybe he's right. If this is the only way he gets turned on, then I'll try it. And before you know it, it's a regular thing where you're being whipped and slapped and suffocated. You know, some men, they love to grip your neck really tight until you can't breathe. I've had clients tell me this. They they grip your neck and you can't breathe. And they will wait until you're desperate. You're desperately gagging and then they'll let you go. And they find pleasure in that. They find pleasure in chaining you up until your wrists get bruised. They find pleasure in seeing whip marks on your body. They love it. That's what turns them on. What kind of normal person gets turned on by something like that? By, by allowing themselves to whip their wife and abuse their wife in such a way like a slave used to do, like a pagan master used to do to their slaves. If you're telling me that's normal, if you've been brainwashed into believing that's normal, girl, you need therapy. Because this is the way that his qareen can degrade and humiliate you and bring you down to his level. The empath has to be brought down to the level of the narcissist, so you and him are one, or you and her are one. You'll be brought down to that level, because when he inflicts that physical abuse on you, and he finds sadistic pleasure from it, and he just looks so happy with himself, know that his qareen is rewarding his ego for punishing you, because that ego wants to see you damaged. Yeah, you whip that empath, you better whip that empath good. We hate that empath. You better, you better whip that believer of Allah. Show her who's boss. Show her who's boss. And I promise you, a real true empath wouldn't even make it that far. As soon as an empath understands what it is that you need from her, well, she'll be out of that door. 
She'll be out of that door, running back to her father, running back to her family house, running back to wherever she came from. She's not going to stick around to be abused in that way, but a codependent will. A codependent will tolerate. And again, a codependent can also be empathic. So when I say, the Qareen says to, you know, to punish the empath, it's the empath in that codependent. Because codependents can be very empathic. And the mission of the Qareen is to completely destroy your empathy. When they destroy your empathy, you destroy your Iman. When your Iman is destroyed, you become a narcissist. Their mission is to make you one of them. And how do they do that? By bringing you all the way down to their level. So that you start accepting the same filth that they are inflicting upon you. Once you start accepting that filth, you now become one of them. And you're not so appealing anymore because the challenge is over. Mission completed. You're one of us now. Time to move on to new grass. Need to find fresh meat. You now become boring to the narcissist. That's why these relationships are so toxic because codependents get really upset. Like, well, after everything I've done for you, after everything I've tolerated for you, I've been whipped, I've been slapped, I've been gagged, I've been suffocated, I've been peed on, I've been everything. And you, you want to leave me? You've cheated on me? You've gone to a new supply? Oh, yes, he will. Of course he will. Because now you're just the same as him. He's made you the same as him. He's no longer interested in you. You're boring to him now. He needs new toys to play with. And that is why so many women don't understand. They go out of their way sexually to please a man. They will do outrageous things. Things that they would never have imagined in a million years that they'd ever do to please a man. They will do it. Only for the man to go and cheat on them. And it drives a woman crazy because she's like, I've done everything he wanted. I've degraded myself. I've humiliated myself. How can he cheat on me after everything I've done for him? What could I possibly do to please him more than this? You don't understand the narcissistic mindset. A narcissist will only be satisfied when you become who he is. Someone who loathes themselves. Someone who's so disgusted at themselves. Someone who is so disappointed with themselves. That's how a narcissist feels about themselves. When they get you to the same place that they're at, they'll look for new supply. And it will always be at the peak of you reaching exactly what it is that they want from you. And that's when you'll be the most confused, like, what? After everything I did, after everything I put myself through, after all that humiliation, he's betrayed me, he's looking for a second wife, he's on Musmatch, he's got a profile on dating apps, he's got a profile on Tinder, why? You demand an explanation, he can't give you one because he doesn't, he won't explain it to you. They just need to get you to a certain place and then drop you because halas, mission over, their mission is finished. They've got you to a place where you are so degraded that you are no longer appealing for them. Okay? I'll come more into this in a bit. Another thing uh, women have complained about is abuse with sex toys. So their husbands will violate their bodies and rape their bodies with sex toys. They've been hurt by sex toys or... You know, he just has this really weird fetish with using so many weird toys on her body and objects and just things. And it's made a woman feel very uncomfortable because it's almost like he's experimenting on her. And again, sadistic pleasure where he's experimenting with her body, but not using his body. He's using, you know, toys and causing pain in, in a lot of cases. Um, another thing that narcissists will engage in is haram sexual acts. So I've spoken to women who, um, who have said to me that their husbands have requested anal sex. They've demanded anal sex, actually, saying that it's the only way they can be satisfied. And a lot of women have complied and obliged. Again, codependent women, empathic women would never do it. Codependent women will do whatever whatever it takes. They will give up all their principles, morals, everything. 
I'm talking about severe codependence here, in order to please a husband. They will do it. They will give up everything to keep a marriage together. And this is disastrous. And again, once you do that, the narcissist is like, well, I got her to where I need her to be. She's given up her deen. She's given up her principles, her morality, the way she was raised, all of that, her dignity to please me. She's allowed me to enter her from the rectum. Oh, my job's done. I need new supply now. You know? So a lot of these religious men will, um, religious looking men, sorry, will request haram acts like anal sex. And they will also insist on having sex with their wives during their menses, during their period, which is disgusting, which is absolutely vile. But there are men who are totally fine with it. They don't care if they've got blood everywhere, all over them. They're not phased by it because they're satanic. Their energy is so satanic. Like, again, it's abnormal, but for them it's normal, for them it's acceptable. But they somehow manage to convince a codependent or another narcissist to have sex while they're on their period. And women do it too. Narcissistic women will encourage a man to uh, penetrate her while she's on her period. He might not want to, but she's like, look, if you don't do it, I'm not going to have sex with you for, for the next two weeks. I'm telling you, I need it. You're going to do it for me right now. And then he'll fight. He'll feel obliged to do it as well. He'll feel forced to have sex with her while she's on her period so that she doesn't go and cheat on him. He's now scared. What's she going to do? What is she going to do if I don't have sex with her now while she's on her period? She's now scared him into doing it. So there are some women who demand that their husbands have sex because they're feeling horny on their period or whatever. They don't care about halal or haram. All they care about is their desires. Narcissists are driven by their desires. Always remember that. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Cursed are those who come into their wives from their rectum. And there's another hadith. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, The one who has intercourse with a menstruating woman or with a woman in her rectum or who goes to a fortune teller has disbelieved in what was revealed to Muhammad disbelieved you're you're no longer a believer that's how serious it is because of the illnesses stds you could get from menstrual period it's it's toxic it's not clean it's it's dirty blood so anyone who is happy to you know sleep with their wife while she's on her period i'm telling you that guy is messed up in the head totally and utterly messed up in the head that's not normal that's disgusting okay Right. Another thing that I have heard from both men and women is that sometimes their narcissistic partner likes to pee on them. Yes, you heard me right. Pee on them. Um, some narc Muslim men have told their wives that in order for me to be aroused, I need to pee on you. And wallahi, some women, some codependent women, unfortunately are accepting this treatment sometimes it's on the face can you imagine how much the qareen is so happy with this treatment of someone who's empathic someone who prays someone who has allah in their lives you're now treating a believer of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this way by urinating on their bodies the body that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told you to look after. Unfortunately, codependent women are being roped into vile acts. Men too, by the way. Again, men, some men are being forced to pee on their wives. Some, some women like it. Some women request that their men pee on them. Because it makes them feel good. You have to be 50 shades of weird to even want something like that. I'm telling you. Like, I feel my skin's crawling just thinking about it. But there are people who request to be urinated on and want to urinate on other people or urinate on their wives in order to have some twisted type of satisfaction from that because 
it comes from that qarin punishing again punishing that victim someone else also mentioned being hit in you know during sleeping so she said that her husband would be sleeping next to her and in the middle of the night you know he's hitting her beating her pinching her and he'll pretend to be asleep <laughs> he'll pretend to be having a nightmare but he's actually abusing her while she's sleeping because it's the only time he can do it it's the only time he can inflict physical abuse on her and justify it by him being asleep or him sleepwalking or or something like that there are women who are experiencing being abused while sleeping because it's the only time he can do it sometimes women do it to men as well they'll kick men in the sleep in their sleep they will try and suffocate a man in his sleep they will just do weird things even in the morning when they try to wake someone up for fajr their husband up for fajr she would just pour freezing water on his face to abuse him and vice versa as well by the way i've had it happen to women where a man will try and wake up his wife for fajr and he'll throw icy water on her face brutally get up for fajr you lazy pig it happens so narcissists don't underestimate them they will do things like that and blame it on their sleep as well blame abuse on on them sleepwalking or having a nightmare they'll say oh sorry i had a nightmare but during the nightmare he'll punch you in the face or kick you out of bed or punch you in the back because he's had such a violent reaction to the nightmare a lot of them fake it by the way they're not really having nightmares they know what they're doing they're awake and they're conscious another thing i've heard is um men and women do this um telling their partner to film them having sex or sex acts and requesting nudes okay so even if you're married i honestly i don't recommend that you guys send nudes to each other and the reason why is because if you die and someone finds your phone or it gets into the you know the wrong hands and people see those video clips or pictures of you naked Dude, that's not good. That's not good. And you know why I say that? It's because I know someone it happened to. Um, There was a woman I know, and she said to me, she was heavily codependent, and her husband had requested that they film themselves having intercourse. And she said he would actually film, um, he would film it from a digital camera and then save the footage on a USB to watch on the TV later on. So anyway, so she said that um, one day he was actually watching it in the living room and he placed the, after watching it, he placed the USB next to the TV and he went out. She didn't realise, she didn't notice that he had watched anything. But anyway, she had her parents over one weekend and they were, she had a fire stick, a fire stick to watch, you know, Netflix and Prime and everything on her TV. So her father was asking her where the fire stick was and she said it's next to the TV. He thought the fire stick was the USB. He plugs the USB into the TV. And lo and behold, he's watching his daughter have sex with her husband on a massive flat screen TV. And I'm telling you, she was so traumatised she had to go to therapy for it. I think her dad did as well. Because that's not something you ever want to see. But you don't know in whose hands things like this can fall into. Don't do it. I'm telling you, don't do it. There's no need for it. And I'll tell you another reason why there's no need for it. It's because a lot of these narcissistic demons will blackmail you with it later. So if you do want to, you know, apply for a divorce later, you want to expose them later for everything that they're doing to you, they'll say, oh, okay, yeah, you go do that. Look, I've got this USB. I've got these nudes off you. You think I'm going to stay silent? If you divorce me, these nudes are going to be all over, all over social media. I'm going to send them to your parents. I'm going to send them to your brothers. Oh, trust me, they'll stoop that low. Narcissists will stoop that low. Don't give them things that they can use against you later. You'll be the biggest fool if you do that. You're married to someone problematic and you give him or her tools and things to use against you later, you'll be 50 shades of stupid. I'm telling you, don't ever do that to yourself. 
to ever give them anything that they can use to blackmail, blackmail you with later. All this stuff about, oh, I'm your husband, send me nudes, send me this, send me that. Just put your foot down and say, no, I'm not comfortable. What if something happens to your phone? What if something this? What if something that? Don't do it. The way they always make excuses for things, you also make excuses for things like this. Protect yourself. Protect yourself from future blackmail, blackmailing because I'm telling you it's happened to a lot of people. Another thing that happens is that they force you to watch porn and replicate what you watch. They'll do that. A lot of vile acts that they will make you do um, that can cause depression because... Again, you're being, you're being brainwashed to believe that it's your duty as a husband or a wife to oblige and comply if this is the only thing that makes them feel sexually satisfied. So they might force you to watch this filth as well. Maybe you've never been into it. Maybe you've never watched anything like that in your life. But now you find in your marriage that you're becoming addicted to it too because he or she's dragging you into watching this filth with them. And now you're dragging problems to yourself you're dragging satanic energy to yourself and the ashik jinn and everything horrible is coming to you as well now you're becoming narcissistic like the narcissist because they're forcing you to watch the same filth that they're into um another thing is marital rape and forcing painful sex so a lot of women a lot of women complain about this being forced into having sex when they just don't want to they're tired, they're exhausted, they're painful down there. Even after having a baby, a man won't even wait for the 40 days to be over. He will, he'll say, look, if you don't have sex with me, I'm going to go commit zina, <clears throat> Or I'm going to go and take a second wife. If you don't have sex with me, she's still, she, you know, she's still not over the 40 days. And some women have to go through very painful sex during those 40 days just to keep him calm. Just to calm the dog down. Because she doesn't want her marriage to be ruined over it. She will allow him to have sex with her during the 40 days that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given her off to heal from childbirth. Because he is a horny dog who can't, can't control himself. And it's painful for her. And she feels forced. A lot of women are actually raped. They're raped again and again and again. Even when they're telling the man to stop, they're begging him to stop, he will still do it because he will say, this is, my, this is my right in Islam. If you don't give it to me by will, I'll take it by force. I mentioned this in my last podcast. Where in what hadith, in what religion does it say that a man can take his right by force if a woman's not giving it to him? You can divorce her if you want to. You can't take anything by force though. You can't rape a woman if she's tired. If she's got valid reason for not sleeping with you, if you've abused her, if you've whipped her and now she doesn't feel like sleeping with you. But all of a sudden you just kind of feel that you have to act on impulse and take your right by force. All you want, uh, you know, all you want is your, are your needs fulfilled. And you're telling me that's not marital rape. Marital rape exists 1000%. Women are being raped in their own marriages and men are being raped in their own marriages. I know that sounds crazy, but wallah, wallah, there are men going through marital rape as well. Where a woman is forcing a man to have sex when he's exhausted, when he's tired. She's forcing him to do that as well. And it can really depress men too, to be, you know, always put in a situation where he's forced to have sex when he just can't. And if he doesn't, he's shamed for it. There are some women who are like beasts, by the way. There are some women who are vile and aggressive and violent. And you better believe that men are sexually abused as well. Don't think it's just women. It's just men can't talk about it. Men cannot talk about it. It's too embarrassing. It's too shameful for them to talk about marital rape and sexual harassment in their own marriage. There are vile women out there, people. Aggressive, violent, degrading who will treat their men like animals, like farm animals, in, 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 in what they call intimacy. And it can be painful. It can be really painful as well. 
Like a man will tell a woman to stop doing something because it's hurting him. It's hurting his down there. And, oh, she doesn't care. She's still going on. She's making it. She's making him sore. She's making him bleed. She's making it very painful for him. And she doesn't care. She keeps going. Because she's getting sadistic pleasure from it. Narcissistic pleasure from seeing him suffer. She knows it hurts. She doesn't care. She'll keep going. So there is, there is marital rape for men too. You know, the bodies are used as objects. Bodies are used as objects. And that's why, again, something that a lot of women complain about is that there's no foreplay for them. That even when a man wants to have sex, he, he already comes to a woman and he's turned on. He doesn't realise, or he knows, but he just can't be bothered to warm a woman up. Women, women are like ovens, you know, you switch an oven on, you've got, to wait, you've got to wait a while for it to heat up. But a lot of these red pill men, they will come to their wives already aroused and expect the wife to be ready there and then without any foreplay whatsoever. So when they force themselves on, that, on, that, on their wives, it's painful. It's painful because she's not warmed up yet. And that's why sex becomes something so distressing for a lot of women who are unable to bear intimacy any kind of intimacy because it hurts so much it hurts and they feel used and abused and they feel like they really do feel like prostitutes slaves who just have bodies that these men want to enjoy and just dump in because you know that's how they're being treated a lack of foreplay or no foreplay at all it's against the sunnah, it's against the deen. It's an obligation upon the man to make sure that a woman enjoys sexual intimacy as well. And that can only be done when there is foreplay involved beforehand. Another thing um, men and women complained about as well was their narcissistic husband or wife wanting sex all the time. Especially men who work from home or maybe they're unemployed or work part-time. Um, women complained about men constantly in between prayers wanting sex. And sometimes they don't even care about the prayer times. They just want their wife there and then. And she'd have to stop everything she's doing, again, using the same hadith of the woman on her camel saddle that's completely taken out of context and used and abused. And she... As, you know, as well as other women, get very depressed because of the amount of times they have to do ghusl. Like to have a full shower after every time she has intercourse with her husband. This can be really depressing and tiring for a woman, especially if she's got long hair or curly hair and hair that needs to be styled. So there are some schools of thought that say a woman has to have, and a man, have to have ghusl from head to toe every time after sex so that they can be clean enough to pray and other scholars have said that it's enough for them to just wash you know their private parts and then do wudu if it's an inconvenience for them to keep having full showers during the day so you know something like this can make someone go mad especially a woman and even a man like if a man's really not up for it if he's really tired exhausted he just come back from work and he's not up for having intercourse and then having a full shower and then praying Maghrib, for example, and then her wanting it again and then having to have ghusl all over again. It can be really inconvenient for a man as well. Like, it's a real hassle to deal with someone who is constantly needing sex. I mean, it's considered to be something abnormal as well to constantly need sex. I mean, do you not have anything else to do during the day? Is that all you think about? The, the more you think about it, the more you're going to want it. So it just indicates what's going on in that person's mind all day. Like when women tell me, oh, my husband wants me to have sex with him four or five times a day. I'm just like, what does this guy do for work for a living? Is there nothing that he does apart from have sex? And then she'll go and beg him to go and have a second wife. And he's like, nope, there's no second wife. You're going to do whatever it is that I want because you're my wife. I don't want a second wife. And she's begging him, please go take a second wife. And he's like, no. Because she's asked for it. 
if she didn't want him to take a second wife, she was begging him not to take a second wife, believe me, that's what he'll go and do. Narcissists always do the opposite of what you want. And so it's considered to be something inconvenient, abnormal and very irritating when someone is constantly nagging you on your back for sex multiple times a day. It can be exhausting and it can be re- it can get depressing. It can actually turn into something that causes someone depression because they have to stop everything that they're doing. They might have important things that they need to get on with and it's just not the right time. But that person is horny all the time because they're either watching pornography while you're at work or that's all they're thinking about. All they're thinking about is sex. And so it's the only thing that they feel that they want from you. And again, they'll abuse you spiritually, verbally, physically sometimes. They'll shame you if you're not up for it. If you can't do it, they'll say, oh, you're not a man. You're, you're not a man, you're a weak. You can't do it three, four times a day. Oh, you're, you're so weak. What kind of man are you? And if it's a woman, again, he'll shame her. He'll say, oh, why did I marry a woman like you? I should have married X, Y, Z. You know, I should have married my ex. She was always up for it. My ex was always up for doing whatever I wanted her to do. She was always on heat. That's what they'll start to do. They'll start comparing you to other people. You know, I shouldn't have divorced my ex, you know. She was always uh, compliant and obedient. She never never complained about me wanting sex all the time. They start to do things like that. And men, you know, men will get it too. My ex-husband used to do this and used to do that. I should have stuck with him. Oh, you'll get that. You'll get that from narcissistic women. And it's at these times when they also reveal the past unlawful relationships that they've had as well. They might reveal it here at this point in time. And it will make you feel really sick, really disgusted at yourself that you married such a person who is a Zani or a Zania because you didn't know that about them before. But it's... a in their moments of frustration or just to annoy you and torture you emotionally here they will bring up that they actually used to have a long-term boyfriend or girlfriend whom they used to sleep with or multiple sexual partners before whom they used to sleep with and they start to compare you to them this is where they start comparing you they compare your body to them they compare your performance to them they compare how frequently they had sex with them, to how frequently they have sex with you. Oh, it will all come out. All that dirt will come out after, after, after you're married. After you're married. Oh, they're not going to shock you with that information before. You're going to find out after you're married to them that they've been involved in filthy relationships before you. And again, this is something that can depress you. It can make you really jealous. It can make you really upset. And it can make you feel dirty, like, oh my god, I married such a person. So, you know, I'm telling you, like, if you're not married yet, take all of this into account, because this is what you're going to get when you're married to a narcissist. Uh, Another woman said to me that her husband, Big Beard, Thob, the lot, um, wanted to bring another woman into their sexual relationship. He wanted to have a threesome with a woman he knows from work who's not Muslim. Can you believe that? Because he said that if I'm going to do that, it would be better that she's not Muslim. So, you know, to protect their reputation, to protect their social reputation in the community so that woman, that Muslim, that third wheel doesn't go blabbing in in the community. So he kept nagging at her to actually do this because it was his wildest fantasy that he he has a threesome and with that particular woman from work. So what happened after that? She got paranoid about him going to work. She started getting paranoid about every tiny thing. It drove her mad, always checking his phone, always, you know, paranoid about him being late, coming home. Now he's planted a seed in her head of what he's doing when he's at work or after work or what he's doing with other women at work. And this gave her extreme anxiety and paranoia. He even showed her pictures of this woman to show her why he wants to invite her into their sexual relationship. And she was just, you know, she's a woman who is much prettier than her. She looks promiscuous. Again, the new supply is always the opposite of the wife or the husband. Always the opposite. 
she was, you know, the slutty type of woman from work. And it was, you know, it was his fantasy. He said, just do this for me. I'm the husband. And if this is haram, pin it on me. He kept telling her, I'll take the blame if this is haram. Don't worry about the haram and halal. It's, 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 I'll take the blame off your shoulder. But just let, you know, let us do this. There are crazy, disgusting, twisted men like that who have no ghira, no, no sense of honour, no shame, no nothing. And they will show you pictures of, you know, people of the opposite sex to make you feel insecure. They will body shame you. If you're a man, you know, she will body shame you about your, about your size. She might even compare you to her ex-husband or ex-boyfriend and say, oh, I've had better I've had a better size, I've had better sex, I've had a better experience, I've had more fun before. They will start to shame you, oh, you need to go to the gym, you need to get more muscle, you need to lose weight, you need to be more curvy. My ex was curvier than you. They'll start to body shame you. And this is this is also sexual abuse because now they're making you feel unattractive, they're making you feel that you're not good enough. And that's why you get some women overnight, they just go and get loads of surgeries done. They're running to the clinic to go and get Botox and liposuction and lip fillers and and God knows what. Because their husbands have made them feel so unattractive from how much they compare them to other women who look nothing like them. And men are the same. Some men hit the gym obsessively in order for their wives to be attracted to them again. I'm talking about codependent men here as well. Empathic men, they would have been like, Ma'as-salama. May God never allow me to see your face again. Empathic men don't stand for anything like this. Wallah, one talaq and he's rid of her. Codependent men stay to prove their worth to this type of woman. And codependent women stay to prove their worth to this type of vile man. So be aware, be very aware of this type of manipulation that is being created to bring your self-worth down. Don't think it's by accident when they come across something or someone that they see and compare you to them. Oh, it's done deliberately to hurt you. I mean, I have a, a client and she said to me that um, her husband's always complaining that she doesn't wear sexy clothes at home and she's quite conscious about her weight so and she's not she's not overweight she's just conscious about how she looks she looks fine and um she said well I will go shopping and I'll I'll go you know but buy some more things and he said no let me do the shopping for you so she said he opened his laptop and he's looking at all of these sites in which there are models wearing the lingerie. And he kept comparing, you know, these models to her. So she kept saying, she said, I was very uncomfortable because he's looking at all of these women in underwear. And she said, I, you know, I was pointing at certain things saying, I think I'd be like that. He'd be like, nah, your body doesn't wouldn't look good in that. And she'd say, okay. She'd point at something else and he'd be like, no, you don't have a chest for that one. She'd be like, okay, let's have a look at another one. He'd be like, no, your bum wouldn't look nice in that. You don't have the bum for that. And that's what he kept saying to her. Every time she pointed something out, he would laugh at her and say, who do you think you are? What kind of body do you think you have? You'd look rubbish in that. It looks good on that model because she's got a good body. It would look rubbish on you. And he would tell her, like, if you want to look good in something like that, you better hit the gym. You know, you better do this. You better do that. You better stop eating those Kit Kats. I'm not going to buy Kit Kats anymore because you're taking away my right to have a wife who's pleasing to the eye. <laughs> and he would honestly laugh at her every time she pointed out something that she'd like. He would laugh at her and say, well, who do you think you are? What kind of body do you think you have to want to wear something like that? So in the end, I said to her, look, how did this end? What did you guys agree on in the end? And she said, we didn't agree on anything. He chuckled to himself. He closed the website and he said, you know what? We're not doing this. When you fix your body, we'll have a look at websites and and things to buy. Because the more I look at these models, the more I realise, no matter what you wear, it's just not going to look good and it's going to frustrate me even more. Oh, 
my God, it took every cell in my body to not tell her to divorce that guy as soon as she possibly can. Because living with someone like that is so crippling, so crippling. It is so horrible to be with someone like that. I mentioned it in my last podcast about the guy who told his wife, you know, when she did dress up for him, he looked at her and he laughed at her and he said, please, please just go and put on your normal house clothes because you look ridiculous in that. That's what he tells her every time she dresses up. You look better with your with your trampy house clothes on. Get get out of those clothes. And she's trying her best to like dress up and look nice for him. And this is after having a baby. Like we are living amongst very sick individuals who don't deserve to be married, who do not deserve wives and husbands, I'm telling you. They don't deserve it. They only deserve demons like themselves. Wallahi, and that's why you'll always find the narcissist will always end up with a narcissist at the end of the day. That's who they end up with. They always go back to the stinky, toxic swamp in the end. Oh, okay. Let's get on with this. There's just a few more before I uh, happily finish this podcast. The Another thing that people have been complaining about is men and women are laughing hysterically during sex. Like, just laughing. And it makes their victim feel so uncomfortable because it's almost like a demonic kind of laugh you know like when you see those cartoon characters laugh out loud the evil ones they actually laugh like that (laughs) during intercourse and I'm not going to try and replicate how that sounds but like they will just laugh and laugh and it will come out of nowhere it's a very creepy kind of laugh I've had people who've reported experiencing that And I've also had people reporting experiencing aggression. Like, it's like sleeping with someone who is a beast. Like, just a horrible, angry beast. Like, sometimes they will come to their husband or wife aggressive. And the whole thing will be aggressive. It might not necessarily be painful. But the whole thing just feels so aggressive. And you just want it over and done with as soon as possible. Like, whether it's a man or a woman, they can come to you in that mood where they feel that the only thing that will calm down the aggression or that's come from having a very bad day or from anger that they've experienced towards you or because of you, the only thing that can calm that down is by them having sex. And so when they have sex, they have sex with that very negative energy. And that negative energy passes on to you. Oh, the the energy of Gnosis, the satanic and angry energy of Gnosis can pass on to you. If you haven't read your adhkar before you have any intimate contact with them. That's why I keep telling everybody, read your adhkar before any sexual contact with these people. Because you will get their satanic energy. It will hop onto you. And that's why you feel so awful after sex with them. Because of what they've passed on to you. You now start feeling horrible afterwards and you feel sick and unwell and you get headaches and you just feel weird because they've passed on their energy to you. And this is why, you know, that you know, there are specific du'as that you need to read before sexual intercourse. You know, uh, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that there is a du'a in which um, he's rec- he recommended people to say, especially men... I said, oh Allah, I ask you for her good and for the good of what you have created in her. So if she were to be, to fall pregnant. And I seek refuge with you from her evil and the evil of what you have created in her. So the evil in her is her qareen. You know, you have to seek, you have to seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the evil in someone. And that evil part of someone is their qareen. It's their nafs al-ammara bisuq. You know, you've got to seek protection from that. Because if you don't, if you don't, that evil qareen can afflict you with negativity. And it can inflict your unborn baby with negativity as well. That's why there's an Arabic saying, when they see a really naughty child, and he's naughty all the time, they laugh and they say, Oh Allah, like they say, it looks like the man, 
you know, his father did not say Bismillah Rahman Rahim before he had intercourse with his uh, wife. It looks like Satan uh, managed to enter this child every time. It's just a known thing in the Arab world. You see a child who's so naughty all the time. They say, oh Allah, it looks like that father didn't say Bismillah. He didn't say his dua before. You know, he must have had a really good night that night for him to forget the dua. To have such a naughty child who's like that all the time. It's like a joke now. But it's actually serious because the Prophet Muhammad he warned us about it. He actually warned us about not protecting ourselves with that dua and actually affecting a child with satanic energy that comes from two qareeds working together. Now, no child is born evil. No child is born evil. However, a part of that child's energy will come, you know, the negative energy that comes from behavioural problems in children can come from that. Behaviour problems in children can come from you not reading that dua. Because if you're afflicted by that person's bad energy in their qareen, especially if they're narcissistic, you're at a higher risk of affecting your unborn children and them having unexplainable behaviour problems in their childhood. It's at no fault of their own. But behaviour problems can be passed down from the qareen. And it's unexplainable in a lot of child psychology. They don't really know why children have bad behaviour problems, especially when you know, there's nothing actually wrong going on at home. So it can only be energy passed down from the mother and energy, bad energy passed down from the mother from a traumatic pregnancy as well. If a woman is being abused and hit and beaten and raped during her pregnancy, you better believe that negative energy is going to affect her unborn baby. And again, that results in unexplainable bad behaviour in young children. Children who just cry all the time. They cry and they cry for hours and hours and hours and you don't know what it is. You've fed the baby, you've changed the baby, you've burped the baby. Nothing, nothing seems to be working. It's, it's, part, it's you know, trauma that's passed on in energy. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in another hadith, he addressed this to the men because the men are the ones who, you know, approach their wives for intercourse, if, especially when they want a child and they want the woman to conceive. He told men to say, Bismillahi Allahumma jannibna shaytan wa jannibna shaytan ma razaqtana. Okay, so in the name of Allah, keep Satan away from us and keep him away from what you bless us with. So again, this is where the, the Arab joke comes from. But he didn't say Bismillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So this dua is very important. It's very important to read before you have any intercourse with your wife especially if she's especially if she's narcissistic i'm telling you you do not want a damien out of her you do not want a damien out of her but narcissists will never remember to to say any of these afkar any of these dua they won't do it and if they do it they will do it in a humiliating degrading way for example he might say to his wife you know the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that there's so much evil in you women that I have to read this du'a so that I don't get a satanic child out of you. He might approach it in that way. He'll take it in a different way, in a toxic way, and abuse a woman with it. He'll say, you know, you guys are so toxic, you're all satanic, that I have to read a du'a so that I don't get, you know, satanic energy from you. And he's the Satan in the, in the whole story. He's the one who's satanic and demonic and everything. But he will use it to make a woman feel bad about herself and, you know, her to resent the hadith and resent the prophet and resent the deen and resent everything. Because when men use a hadith and Quranic verses in this manner to make women feel like there's something wrong with them and that they're faulty and demonic and everything, it can really put people, it can put women off being Muslims. A lot of women leave Islam. I'm telling you, every year so many women leave Islam because of this kind of abuse. Because they're not educated enough to understand that this has nothing to do from the deen. It's from his twisted, distorted perspective of the deen. These people will use anything, anything to blame and, you, you know, just abuse in order to make a point, in order to inflict pain 
on on someone. It could be, you know, he, he'll use his own granny, I'm telling you. He'll use his own cat, his own granny, the birds in the sky. He'll blame anything for his abuse. So moving on. Um, another thing that a lot of women in particular complain about when it comes to mar- being married to narcissistic men is that the men leave them unsatisfied deliberately. So they will stop halfway. So for example, let's just say they're in they're in the process and he climaxes and she hasn't climaxed yet, but he just abandons her. He'll just leave. He'll be like, I'm done and good luck to you. And he knows that she's not done. He knows that she's not satisfied, but he really can't be bothered to put in any more work and he doesn't care if she suffers. He'll just walk away. There are so many narcissistic men who will do this. So many. And it's done out of punishment and out of laziness as well. Some men just can't be bothered. And this can be very traumatising for someone who's, you know, been married for the first time. If this is her first experience of intimacy, this can be a trauma in itself. Because not only will she be so disappointed, like, oh my goodness, you know, is is this what it is? Is this what intimacy is? Is this what sex is? It's horrible. This is absolutely horrible because it can be it can be torture to leave someone halfway. It really is torture, and narcissists know that, and narcissists do this to women a lot because they know it takes women a lot more time to climax than them, so they use it as abuse as an abuse tactic to you know to either get the woman to beg him to finish the job or to just stop asking for sex. Like, he'll be happy if she stops asking because he wants sex to be under his command only and demand and not under hers. If he can get her to hate sex, then it's something he can abuse her with. He can punish her with sex every time he's upset with her or something. It's weird, but a lot of men do that because women see sex as something horrible. It's a chore. It becomes a chore. Because she just doesn't enjoy it. He does not know how to make it an enjoyable experience for her. It becomes a horrible experience. Something that she wants over in two minutes flat. Because when she gets used to being abandoned halfway through, time and time again, she will get to a point where she just doesn't want it anymore. And she will only fulfil his sexual rights out of chore, out of it being a chore. She will literally want it over as soon as possible. And she might even have to close her eyes and think of someone else or think of God knows who just to get through those two minutes. And you know what? He's happy because the narcissistic energy in him, the devil in him only wants a body to use and abuse. So if she's okay with it being a two minute job, thank God for that. That will probably be the only time in his life he'll thank God. The only time in his life. Because that's essentially what he wants. He doesn't want to put the work in. He doesn't want any intimate connection. He just wants a body he can use. So when the wife becomes accustomed to it being a job and being a chore and not being an enjoyable thing, and it's over in just a matter of a few minutes, oh, this is brilliant for the narcissist. Brilliant. I'm telling you, Alhamdulillah will come out of his lips at that moment in time. It's the unfortunate reality of a lot of women out there who just don't have any, any enjoyable sexual relationship for years and years and years in their marriages. They go without it for years. Or they just learn to do it alone because it's the only way they can get any kind of sexual pleasure And relieve them of their, you know, of any desires they get. It's, it's really sad, but unfortunately this is, this is how it is with a lot of our so-called Muslim men whom a lot of women have no choice but to marry because Muslim men are the only men we can marry. And I promise you, if there was an official fatwa that allowed Muslim women to marry Jews and Christians, it's just because it's a grey area, I promise you, so many women would not marry Muslim men. They would flock to marry men who are from other religions because of the traumas 
that women have gone through by marrying Muslim men because they have no other choice but to marry the Muslim men who are available in our ummah. I'm telling you, if those floodgates opened, Muslim women would not go anywhere near Muslim men, the majority of Muslim men. It's only because there's no official fatwa that it's not happened. But saying that, there are over 120,000 Muslim women who have already done that because of the traumatic experiences they have had been married, you know, being married to Muslim men before. Some imams are actually now facilitating the marriage of Muslim women to non-Muslim men because of this problem. I'm going to do another podcast about this. Honestly, this deserves another podcast because I don't think that a lot of men realise what they're pushing a lot of Muslim women to. Not only are they pushing Muslim women to zina, married Muslim women to zina because they're not getting their sexual needs fulfilled in marriage. They're being easily duped by other narcissists into getting involved in, in, in unlawful relationships out of marriage just to have their sexual needs met because they're going for years without it. And that they're pushing Muslim women to marry non-Muslim men because they cannot afford to risk marrying another Muslim man. For them, it's better that they marry someone who's not Muslim at all, who's going to use and abuse the religion to control them and abuse them, than it is to marry someone who is Christian or Jew, who will treat them right. I'm telling you this, uh, oh God, another podcast for this subject, about what Muslim women are being pushed to right now. And men. I'm not excluding men from this. Why do you think there's a surge also in Muslim men marrying women who are Jews and Christians? Again, it's because they don't. They're sick of Muslim women. Because the only Muslim women they've come across in their lives have been narcissistic. And they're like, La Allah, if, if, this, if this is what Muslim women are like, after doing everything I could to marry this woman, I paid the mahar, I, I paid for this, and I, I, I ensured that she had a nice wedding, and to get that, to get this pile of rubbish at the end of it. No, no, no. I'm going to go and marry someone who's not Muslim. We have a massive surge in Muslim men marrying non-Muslim women too, by the way. Because of this problem. Because they've been traumatised by not muslim women. So yeah, definitely. It's going to be a subject for another day, inshallah. But I wanted to mention this hadith of the Prophet Muhammad who said, If any of you, men, has intercourse with his wife, let him be true to her. Let him be good to her. If he attains his pleasure before her, then he shouldn't hurry away until she also attains her pleasure. So, you know, the Prophet Muhammad, and this is just logical. This is just logical information. If, you know, because men, more often than not, they do climax before the women. So if they climax before the women, it's just logical that they would be nice and patient and decent enough and loving enough to, you know, hang around until she's satisfied as well. In, I'm telling you, in what religion does it say that a woman's, uh, you know, unless it's satanic religion, that a woman's right is not, a woman's right to sex is not as equal as a man's right to sex. In Islam, it's equal for both. A man is entitled to sexual fulfillment the same way a woman is entitled to sexual fulfillment it's equal there is no men deserve it more or men are entitled to more sexual fulfillment than women because they can't control themselves and there are dogs on heat all the time no 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 it's equal because the prophet Muhammad actually said that the sexual desire of a woman is actually more than a man more than a man go back to my previous podcast to learn about that so it's equal. There is no because I'm a man, I need more sex. Rubbish. It's equal. She is entitled to sexual fulfillment as much as you. There is no exception to the rule here in Islam. It's equal. Both people, you know, both men and women get married to protect themselves from zina. They both get married to enjoy halal intimacy. It's not that a woman marries just to fulfil the sexual needs of her husband and he's he neglects her. 
If you're married to a narcissistic man-child, he will love the two-minute job. Because, like I said, a lot of them are bisexual, closet gay. They're attracted to other things and other people. And they see you as mother and or they see you as father. They like the quick intimacy that finishes very fast. Because it means less effort and them having to imagine everything under the sun in order to get through the whole process, the whole ordeal. And, you know, that takes me on to something else that someone mentioned to me and she actually caught her husband with another man. And again, we're talking about someone who's supposedly religious, someone who goes to the masjid, someone who does fundraising at charity events. He was caught in her house, in her marital home, having sex with another man in their bedroom. And he's thinking that she's, you know, going to be away with her sisters for the day. This stuff happens. And it's, it's, you know, these are things that people can't talk about. You know, they have to take these things with them to the grave. And they're tortured mentally over not being able to talk to anyone about it because of the shame. I mean, imagine seeing that. So... You know, don't think, don't think for a second that someone who appears religious is going to be pious all the time. A lot of them have skeletons in their closets. A lot of them do. And I'm talking about the narcissistic ones here, the ones who show signs of being narcissistic from the beginning. Don't risk it. Don't risk it. Don't risk marrying these people. I can't say it enough. And if you're married to someone like this, oh my goodness, for the love of God, get out. Get out of this situation. Do whatever it takes to get out of this situation. It doesn't matter if you get divorced. Like Mufti Mink says, you're not the first and you're not the last. Our societies, our toxic cultural societies, chain us to the people we're married to because they make us feel like we're failures if we get divorced. That's not in our deen. Our deen tells us, if you're not happy, if there's no second mod the rahmah, get the hell out of that. Get the hell out of that. That's not a marriage. That's no longer a marriage. If there's no second mod the rahmah, what are you in? You're in a skip. Like, don't feel oppressed and pressured into staying in a marriage like this. Because I'm telling you it's against our deen to even pressurise someone to stay in something like this. Find the strength from somewhere and just get out of that situation. Because I'm telling you it gets worse. It gets a lot worse. If you're already experiencing any of these things, oh, you think it's going to get better with a narcissist? Trust me, it gets worse until he brings you down to his or her level. I promise you this. It will not get better until they completely destroy you. He's got a mission. His qareen's got a mission for you. Our societies force us to kind of believe that the person you choose to marry is the person you have to stay with for the rest of your life. There's no getting out of it. You made your bed, you lie in it. Oh no. Oh no, some people get it wrong. Some people get it wrong. Does that mean if I make a wrong decision... In who I marry, that I have to stick with that decision for the rest of my life and let it destroy me and my iman? What kind of believer am I? What kind of Muslim am I? What kind of human being, creation of God am I? That's no that's no way to live. That's not the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has asked us to live. The next 30 years in absolute misery, just because we made a wrong decision in marrying someone and seeing their true side true self after we get married why is that our fault covert narcissists won't reveal themselves that easily and that quickly sometimes you've got to marry them to see the covert in them the covert demon in them and if allah has blessed you with seeing that early on before you have any kids then leaving such a situation is going to be a lot easier than after you have a child i'm telling you like the first step before divorce is always mediation. I always recommend and advise people to go and get mediation. But if narcissists refuse mediation, get the hell out of there. 
find whatever security you need to secure for yourself and get the hell out of there. Because this is exactly what you're going to go through. Don't marry anyone who shows you any of these signs before marriage. Wallahi, you're just going to ruin your life with a decision based on chemistry, based on having fun, based on, wow, he's an imam. Wow, she's a Quran teacher. Wow, she's a alima. Don't be fooled by things like this. A lot of narcissists get into this line of work because... It's the best way to deceive people and it's the best way to deceive their prime targets. People who fear Allah, people who love Allah, people who are naive, you know, people who do anything to please Allah. Oh, okay. I'm going to use her fear of Allah and love of Allah to completely manipulate her in this marriage. So they get involved in the deen. They get involved in da'wah. They get involved in teaching people Quran. How many scandals have we heard about people who teach Quran? People who are tajweed teachers. Even Quran reciters, nasheed artists. Don't be fooled. Don't be fooled. For for a lot of people, it's just a facade. You know, and, and I'm just on my last point before I end this podcast. Is uh, it's very long this podcast? Oh my goodness. But. You know, it's just important important information you all need to know. Um, the la- the very last thing I'm going to mention that I've, you know, heard p- people say, is that some narcissists they enjoy being very dirty, like physically dirty. They won't wash down there. They'll be so unhygienic. They will smell bad. They won't have a shower. They'll smell of sweat, and it's those times they want intimacy when they are in a very unhygienic state of being um and if they're in an unhygienic state of being they want you to stoop so low and degrade yourself to actually accept and you know having any kind of sexual contact with them while they're in that dirty state very unhygienic you know like I've, i've even read it on forums that men have felt so repulsed by sleeping with women because they smell so bad whether it's sweat whether it's down there whether it's like they just smell so bad but narcissists don't actually seem to mind the smell they don't even notice the smell they're like oh I smell absolutely fine but they smell so bad and again because narcissists like to live in filth like when they're on their own narcissists live in filth in front of people or they're posh and they wear designer clothes, and they wear Chanel perfume, and they wear Christian Dior perfume. Trust me, when they're by themselves, they are so unhygienic. So unhygienic. And when they get into a comfort zone with you, when they get very comfy with you, they will stop being so groomed. And all of a sudden, you'll find them coming to bed and they smell bad. Like, hey, can you go and have a shower because you don't smell very nice? And he's like, they get offended. What do you mean I don't smell very nice? I smell absolutely fine. You've got a smell problem. You've got, an, you've got a problem with your nose. They'll blame you. But in reality, they just want you to deal with their unhygienic self because, again, that's a part of their qareen and ashiq jinn. The jinn, again, like I said, they like things that are not pleasant. They like the bathroom. They like sewages they like people who smell bad and that's why it's really important to maintain a high level of he- of hygiene even when you're alone because when you don't you attract the ashiq jinn to you i'm telling you you'll attract the ashiq jinn to you that's why we wash with water that's why we you know we have frequent showers and and we have ghusl and we have wudu it's to keep away the evil jinn from us because they're attracted to people who are unhygienic and smell bad. So if your husband or wife is, are, you know, they're requesting you to sleep with them while they're in a state of being unhygienic, refuse, completely refuse it. Because like I said, you're going to take on their satanic energy. You've got to refuse it. 
because again they're trying to make you stoop down to a degraded level as to having to deal with that like oh my god I've got to sleep with someone who stinks and sometimes uh, you know a man or a woman would just do it just to get it over and done with but afterwards you will feel so awful about yourselves you'll feel sick I'm telling you you'll feel physically sick so, yeah, that was just another point I had forgot to mention earlier that, you know, some people have uh, mentioned frequently. They love being unhygienic. And that's why they look like tramps. That's why the women look like tramps after a while. You know, you'll marry such a glamorous woman and after a short period of time, she's such a tramp at home. She wears horrible clothes. Clothes that don't match. Clothes that smell. The same clothes for days. That's who they really are. And the man will wear the same clothes for years. Years and years he won't bother to change his house clothes. He'll go out for the rest of the world and buy suits and Armani shirts and diesel jeans and everything. But at home, he'll wear the same clothes he's worn for the last 10 years. That's who they really are. So, boy, what a podcast. Whew, I'm glad that's done. <laughs> I need to go and make a cup of tea now and listen to something positive. I do recommend you guys to never sleep after listening to things that are so negative like this. Things that make your stomach turn. Always go to bed after listening to something positive and always read your adhkar before you go to bed. Don't sleep after listening to things that are unpleasant. And I know this is unpleasant. And it may have triggered bad memories, flashbacks, all of that. But I'm aware of this. But I just want you to make sense of everything that's happened to you so that you can find closure and you can find peace and understanding in what I've had to say to you. Because I'm telling you, it's the only way you'll be able to move on when you fully understand what's happened and why you kind of got involved in certain things, you know. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much for listening, if you're still with me until now. And please do like, share and subscribe to the channel for more content to come. Do share it please with other people who will and can heal from uh, this information inshallah. And again, if you're in this situation where you're still married to someone like this, don't forget your adhkar, don't forget your dua before you have any sexual contact with them. Protect yourselves from their demonic energy and just stay safe, all right? Just stay safe from these weird people. So, yeah, until the next podcast, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.